What's going on, fam? It's your boy, Brandon C. Pierce with the elephant in the room. And I am so excited to be joining you all on a Tuesday night. This is different. I'm used to being with you all on Sunday nights uh, for the elephant in the room. It's a normal broadcast. And of course, on our Thursday nights for our local church's uh, Bible study, but never on a Tuesday night. Well, I was on live during Tuesday night for the uh, Koji collection stuff, but you know, that's all behind us now. Anywho, tonight, tonight, um, as a follow up to something that I posted on Facebook the other day that seemed to generate a lot of energy, a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, uh, I decided that, you know what, maybe just maybe we ought to have a conversation about this particular thing. Well, what was the thing, Pierce? A couple days ago, I posted a picture of the sainted founder of the Church of God in Christ, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason. He was sitting there and he had roots and sticks and uh, twigs and just all type of uh, articles in front of him. And he was holding one of them in his hand. And, and I didn't say anything about it. I just literally posted Bishop Charles Harrison Mason. And my phone began to ring and I got text messages and people in my inbox like, what are you saying, Pierce? What's up with this picture? Was Bishop Mason a root worker? What, was he involved in hoodoo? Was it voodoo? What was going on in those pictures? And I said, you know, I may not be able to fully properly answer the question, but I do know somebody who's able to. And so tonight I am honored to welcome to the Elephant in the Room platform for the very first time. Uh, he is a visiting professor at Morehouse College. Uh, he is uh, a Kojic historian. He is, man, he is just a phenomenal guy. He's also an author. He, he wrote a book entitled Sanctified Revolution, the Comprehensive History of the Church of God in Christ. If you don't have it, you need to get it. It's on Amazon. Listen, do me a favor. Help me welcome to the stage for the very first time, my friend, my brother and mentor, Dr. Ovell Hamilton. Dr. Hey, Hamilton, welcome, doing? sir. How you doing, Superintendent? You all right? All right? Man, I am doing wonderful this <laughs> evening. Just kind of, you know, enjoying the evening. It's it's a little chilly outside, but that's all right. You oh, know? yes. Oh, yes. It's a good day. Good day. Yeah, yeah. beautiful day. Man, I, I tell you, I had, this has been an uh, interesting past couple of days. Who knew that one picture could... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this, so much. this is not the only time that pigeon calls some controversy. <laughs> ah, so listen, I, I'm I'm just going to jump into it. You okay. are you have written a book, uh, Sanctified mm -hmm. Revolution, uh, about the history of the Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. And 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 like I was saying before, I brought you on. If people don't have it, they need to get it because you go down into the nitty gritties of the history of the yes, church. You don't hold yeah. any punches. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love that. Mm -hmm. um, this is the question that I will start off with. Okay. And we, we can go from there. All right. Uh, it seems to me, you, growing up in this grand old church of God in Christ, mm -hmm. man, one of the things that every one of our churches was going to have was a picture of Bishop Mason. Yes. Uh, yes. Bishop Mason has become almost a sacred cow in our church. Mm -hmm. um, I remember right after the Clark sisters, uh, movie came out, mm -hmm. uh, we were having some conversation about it. And I said, right. well, if you think their story is interesting, you ought to. We ought to do one about the life of Bishop Mason. And yeah, people, yeah, people came for me, but but doesn't it seem um, uh, almost uh, along the lines of idol worship the way we handle the founder? Uh, in some cases, yeah, and it depends on who you talk to, and it depends on what area of country you're in. Um, but you know, it, it I think it grows from because even when I was writing history, and like like when you asked me the question, do you want to? Do you want to know facts or do you want to know Kojic facts? Okay, you so facts. So that, <laughs> you know the difference. You know the difference. I do. And so there was a lot of legends and a lot of stories, uh, a lot of stuff that you could not prove. And like, say, when I started researching everything, because uh, like one of the stories was that a tornado hit the jail in Lexington and when and let Bishop Mason go in the jail. But when I found the records, now he was moved from Lexington to the Federal European in Jackson, Mississippi. That was the record sound. But the other stories you heard, a tornado came and through the town and tore up the jail and Bishop Mason was allowed to go free. But that was not what was factual. Like say, I found the records and I found out that he was in Lexington, but they moved him to Jackson, Mississippi. 
there's a whole lot of other, like, especially I, I did some of it in the book, uh, and there's probably gonna have to be another book written because there's a lot of other stuff like that. But the picture you, uh, like, say you that you had, and you notice that he had all different trinkets, uh, different oddities in nature, like the man's hand that he was holding up, the, mm -hmm. the stick is in shape of a dog. Well, according to the records that I researched, James, well, James Depp, one of the white preachers that uh, Bishop Mesa was traveling with Bishop Mesa, uh, especially in Conway, Arkansas, he wrote a book called "They He Made Millions Happy. And so he used to listen to Bishop Mesa preach. And one of the uh, eyewitness accounts that he gave was that Bishop Mesa would use these oddities in nature as a prop while he's preaching to get his message across. Now, the picture you showed shows a different version <laughs> of that prop of those props and uh i was uh like i was in millersville georgia one time i was doing a presentation on church of god in christ and one of the uh, african spiritualists uh one of the guys who was a so like the african spiritualist historian who showed the uh different objects that africans use uh, for conjuring for bringing the spirits but also mostly for connection to the ancestors as well and so when i'm giving my presentation about church of god in christ he asked me at the end of the presentation uh, wasn't your founder using some of these oddities in nature and some of these things like uh, being a conjurer and who do it? And then I had to go to the explanation where, yes, but uh, he was using those as props for preaching and things like that. But it caught me off guard because, like I said, I didn't expect anybody to know anything about Church of God and Christ doing this presentation. <laughs> and so, but the thing is, is that uh, that picture shows, like, say, those objects. But if you notice also in that picture, you see that glow behind him, that, that glowing idea well that goes back to a lot of the religions ancient religions uh especially in egypt samaria hinduism buddhism they have a helio disc behind a divine figure to denote their closeness or their godliness and they have a the sun it'd be usually a circular disc of the sun and you see that a lot in uh, medieval times as well with jesus christ there be a solar disc or like a disc behind him, like like the sun, and so that kind of image was portrayed on uh, portrayed on that image of Bishop Mason, that sun disc, that helio disc, the idea of divineness, uh, that idea of uh, godly or uh, or God himself, and things like that. So you get that kind of sort of like uh, worship of the person. Whether in worship of God, but like I said, it depends. It depends, and like I say, uh, like I say, as a historian, like I say I treat everybody on the, on the same playing field as historical facts instead of legends and stories that it, if I can't prove it, uh, if, I, if I can't find a witness of it, I can't write it down. You know, because right. I I have to go by the facts and by the documentation and by evidence, and that's that's me as a, my profession as a historian. But yes, that picture is uh, very controversial, and like I say, the main ideas that I found in it is that. It was used. He was using those as props, but I think they added the glow on the back, which, like I say, gives that divine kind of solar disc that I've seen in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Egyptian with Horus, Isis, and Osiris. You know, so, so it gives it that kind of aura, as we we'll say, as that divineness, as you would say. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, so I just want to be clear, so we could put all rumors to mm -hmm. bed, because you know that's one of the things. Like I said, we don't talk about. You don't talk negative. Mm -hmm. Right. about the founder you just don't right. do that and right. so right. the mm -hmm. fact that we don't say anything allows speculation to happen so right right for clarity bishop mason was not involved in any type of african spirituality yeah it was i don't yeah i don't think it was uh like a i think it was like maybe a uh an affinity uh because of the you know growing up in the deep south like that and growing up uh like say uh, like I myself, being from the country, you know, I would pick up objects like that uh, or see objects that's in the shape of a person's hand or in the shape of an animal. And we would pick them up and use them and things like that for different things. And I think some of the uh, 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 records that I've seen, uh, there may be an affinity of like, say, his affinity was using the objects to get his message across as far as him preaching the gospel or him trying to preach and uh, preach a lesson. Like get a lesson across in that in that ways. I don't think it was like say used to put a hex on somebody or or put you know or put a spell on somebody or things like that. But he was uh, what James Delp and other uh, people who were 
uh, eyewitness accounts at the time was saying that he was using them preaching because then I saw other preachers uh, that were doing that time as well using those some kind of those same objects and some other culture preachers, Church of God in Christ preacher. They were using it. So they probably were, you know, copying the founder in, in the way he was doing it. And so they were using it, too. But like I said, I don't think it was like a, a conjuring or a hoodoo kind of thing, even though, like I say, that's the way it seems, that's the way it appears. But I don't think he was into, like, say, conjuring hoodoo. It was just that he was using them as props and, and using them as objects to get his message across doing where he was preaching. And that's the evidence that I found. Now, as a historian, uh, if you find more evidence, con whether contrary to the fact or to support the fact, you change it changes. I mean, but that's the evidence that I found at this time. Now, like, say, somebody else may come behind me and find different evidence and find a more conclusive uh, answer to it. And, and like I say, it will have to change. But that's the evidence that I see now that he used them as props while he was preaching, not as for, like, say, uh, like a witch doctor or a conjurer or things like that. Okay. And like I said, I think the glow and all that stuff was added later. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. I think all that was added later to, OK, Bishop, I saintly found it, you know, and, you know, and, you know, worship the ground and walk on and thing kind of like that. I think that was all added later and, and docked it up a little bit. After you know, after the incidents and things like that. <laughs> gotcha. So, one of the, another question has always been um, brought up is is of course you know Bishop Mason, uh, Elder Mason, however you want to style mm -hmm. his name at this time, was a student at the Baptist College mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. his education. He right. decided this is not for me. Mm -hmm. I'm out of here. Um, right. That, that there's one accord that he left. There's another accord that he was kicked out. Um, that gets pretty tricky. I, I researched that. Uh, you know, I'm, since I'm from Arkansas, you know, so I went, you know, and my some of my family went to Arkansas Baptist College, as a matter of fact. Um, so uh, some scholars, uh, the earliest, some of the earliest scholars were saying, like, um, well, you know, he had the Holy Ghost, and so he didn't need no schools. Okay. Okay, I let you have that. <laughs> and so when I was doing research on that, as far as his tenure at uh, Arkansas Baptist, because you know he attended with Charles Price Jones, right? Who was Church also Christ the, Holiness USA, right? Right, but they were together first in ba in the Baptist Church. And I say right. I, I come from that. I'm a Baptist uh, son of a Baptist deacon myself, so I came from the Baptist Church too. But they were under the leadership of Elias Camp Morris. The first president of National Baptist Convention USA, which is the largest black organization in the world with eight to ten million members. Okay, uh, so uh, they won his leadership, and so Elias Camp Morris had had a church in Helena, Arkansas, called Centennial Baptist, mm -hmm. and so that was like some of the training grounds for the Baptist preachers in Arkansas. And so our, he was also Elias Camp Morris was also one of the leaders of Arkansas Baptist College, and so I believe he was counting Mason and Jones. You know, to you know, go to the college, get training as preachers and things like that. Now, the thing I look at is when you go to college, okay, uh, when you attend courses, uh, you try to take college courses. There's two major reasons that you uh, drop out. One is money. As <laughs> well as one reason, uh, you don't have the money to go. Which I don't think that was the reason here because I think they're probably compting the Baptist preachers to go to this uh, school. Two, you flunk out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the reason. And so my conjecture, uh, my hypothesis is that Mason was may have had a third or fourth grade education, but even back then, uh, uh, only one in ten people graduated high school. But when you put a person with third or fourth grade education into a college setting without, you know, training to going through the secondary school and post secondary schools and things like that, and and basically, you know, you you probably couldn't keep up with the curriculum. And that was uh, some of the evidence of some, I think, one of the instructors uh, as well. And then, you know, of course, people take it. Well, the story, you know, the story goes, uh, well, because uh, um, it was written by um, in one of uh, uh, one of the uh, Church of God in Christ uh, history, historical uh, pieces uh, by his daughter. And I think by Jill, uh, edited by Joe Patterson and Bishop German Ross. And I got I got the book upstairs, as a matter of fact. But it says Mason's uh, testimony was that I didn't need I no longer needed schools because I got the Holy Ghost. And that's all I needed was the Holy Spirit. And I'm just paraphrasing. But basically, I got the Holy Spirit. I don't need there's no salvation in schools. Now, I think that's probably where he felt at the time, because that's where he said. 
But uh, I never said he was against what people always when I say that people say, oh, you're saying Bishop Mason is against education. Well, no, I'm not saying that. That's what he said at the time. He did, didn't need schools. And then I like say and then later on, you know, uh, they say, well, he supported schools. And I can see that. I mean, because at that time you probably was going to school and you 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 couldn't keep up with the curriculum. Therefore, you, you know, you washed out. And therefore, OK, well, I don't need schools. I just need the Holy Spirit. And so uh, he left, uh, I think, after three months of attending the uh, school there in, Ar in Little Rock, Arkansas. And then he went on, you know, went out and preached and things like that. So but again, I uh, in that wise uh, Mason, what I what I call I think I put in the book as well. Mason equalized the pulpit. So that's a good thing. And it's a bad thing. Uh, equalize it. The good thing is, is that he allowed everybody, whether regardless of education, that you can preach in the pulpit. You can be a pastor with regards of education. The bad thing is that everybody can preach in the pulpit regardless of education. <laughs> so it's good and bad. <laughs> so, but uh, but yeah, that's the uh, some of the facts behind his uh, tenure at Arkansas Baptist College. But like I say, I always get flack for it because I give the facts instead of giving this. Uh, story like, oh, well, he had the Holy Ghost and he didn't need schools and things like that. Well, no. And then uh, later on, uh, when I've been hearing some conference at Mason and now I was on I was on my call about my book. Uh, well, Mason uh, earned a master's and a Ph.D. Uh, I said from where? And they said Trinity Hall College and Seminary. So I looked up Trinity Hall College and Seminary. I kind of found out it don't exist. Yeah, it doesn't exist. And so you saying he got a master's PhD from this school that don't exist. And uh, but my again, I use common sense. Uh, how you get a master's PhD and you don't even have a BA degree? Now, wait a minute now. Hold on, Doc. <laughs> Hold on, Doc, because we got quite a few preachers in this grand old church and in every church. Well, they well, got degrees that they ain't got even an undergrad well, or high school diploma for. But that, <laughs> that's the next thing. How you get a master's and don't have a high school diploma? <laughs> That's the other thing. <laughs> How you get a bachelor's and you don't even have a high school diploma is what I'm saying. And that's the same thing here. And so when they say that he has a master's PhD, I'm like, is this, what no, what school accredited? What program you go to? What did you study? What's it was a life PhD? experience degree, Doc. Come on. Was what, what's your PhD in? <laughs> is, it, is it in history? Is it in science? Is it in, you know, it's got to be the first man in your life. <laughs> But yeah, you get you get those uh, kind of anomalies, you know, along with uh, when, you, like I said, when you start researching and when you start finding the correct answers, uh, especially like say we're dealing with Mason and the uh, the the, uh, the trinkets and the, the, the different oddities of nature, and also his background in education and things like that as well. You all you come with those oddities, but like I say, when you uncover everything, there there you find the truth, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you found the truth. <laughs> by, by the way, if you are tuning in this evening and you have questions, we are talking about mm -hmm. uh, the sainted founder of the Church of God in Christ, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason. Uh, yeah. it's, this mm -hmm. is kind of a, a, a Black History Night. Amen. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, no so problem, just, yeah. You know, so, OK, because, you know, honestly, you answered because the next question I was getting ready to ask okay. was concerning. Um, I had read that that Bishop Mason had went back to school and got his doctorate. And, you know, I had I had read it, Doc. I, I mean, I had read it. And so what book did you read? That? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, if I can find it before the end of this night, I will let you see it. For yourself. I, I think I know which one it is. I'm just trying to see if it verify which you. I think I know which one. Let me try to find it before the end of the before you get off the island. Yeah, I've seen some of my Kojic counterparts say that he got a massive PhD and uh, and his family, some of his family members said it too. That I think it was his family. I actually read it. was It was yeah. actually I think a book that his family. family put out. Right. That said that he got a master's PhD from Trinity Hall College and Seminary. And you can look it up for yourself. You, know, you don't have to take my word for it. Trinity Hall College and Seminary. That's the school. And like I say, it doesn't exist. And nine times out of ten, if your school don't exist, neither is your degree. <laughs> Let the church say yes. Y'all heard it, preachers. If your school don't exist, it ain't accredited. <laughs> your degree don't. Sorry, sorry. Bring it down. But, here. but it down. I think the last, the last. I think when I looked up the address for the school, it was at uh, Bishop A.T. Moore's address. He was out of Kentucky, 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> if it's JT Moore was at, I think it was his home. You know, I think that's why I'm guessing it was at home. Well, you know <laughs> what? Then, then, then all that you're saying right now is pretty consistent with how these preachers are getting these doctors today. They just found... Let me shut up. Uh, so... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That, that uh, was, was, but I had to, like I said, that came up. That that came up when they was I uh, was doing a um, review of my book when uh certain uh, it was uh, a panel doing a review of my book and critiquing my book, and that question came up. That answer, that statement came up again. That Bishop Mason had a master bid, and so I had to put that to rest. And I said, you know, Pentecostal you know, first of all don't exist, and then second of all, um, you no. Know, if that school don't exist, then neither is that that master and that PhD because it, I believe, it was like a diploma meal. Because uh, I saw evidence of, of a lot of preachers at that time getting degrees from Trinity. And this time, um, mm-hmm. right? And then only about doing maybe a couple of weeks of work or something like that. A couple of weeks, you no, know, maybe, maybe, maybe a couple of weeks. You know, but def- it definitely didn't see. I didn't see no accreditation, accreditation on, on it. Anybody? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I about, I, Lord, I was about to say Bishop. <laughs> but then please talk to us a little bit about uh-huh. um, the split between. between I'm going to start with the original one, the the the, the C.P. Jones. C. Oh, okay. you are going all the way back. Okay, okay. So I, I'll, I'll just I'll just tell you honestly. Okay, you uh, that I am um, mm-hmm. a a somewhat of a product of Cachusa. Okay. Uh, okay. For mm-hmm. for the span of maybe five to seven years of my life, okay. growing up, uh, my family was a member of the New Testament Church of Christ Holiness oh, USA. Yes. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Los Angeles, California. Bishop Robert right. Wynn was our bishop. Okay. And man, I I enjoyed our time. We loved the Lord. I, I never really just understood the. Split. And so y'all were y'all were under Charles Price Jones. Uh, the legacy was Charles Price Jones. Okay. Yeah. Right. And see that. And that's. And I'm glad because since we're talking about them in college anyway. Because, you know, Charles Price Jones finished the program, uh, uh, and, and Mason didn't. He did. And then I had to go uh, to my Kojic brothers and sisters at this point here. When we get to Charles Price Jones, okay, 1897, right, is the year that Mason was walking down 8th and Gaines Street. Mm-hmm. And he got the name in Little Rock, Arkansas, and got the name Church of God in Christ. Christ. First on 214. Okay, 1897. Why does our founding year say 1907? I'm gonna tell you why, <laughs> okay? Because 1897, Charles Spice Jones was a leader of then Church of God in Christ. He was the leader. He was a general overseer. Mason was the overseer of Tennessee. John A. Jeter was the overseer of Arkansas. William S. Pleasant was the overseer of Mississippi, and Charles Spice Jones was the general overseer of all of them at that time. And therefore, the name Church of God and chose the name Church of God in Christ after they said the sanctified church. Uh, the Church of God, they would lose that for a little while. But then when Mason, like say, got uh, and God revealed the name to him, Church of God in Christ, in Little Rock, Arkansas, while he's walking down 8th and Gaines Street, he was under the leadership of Charles Price Jones. And therefore, Charles Price Jones was headquartered in Jackson, Mississippi. So the right. first Church of God in Christ was under the leadership of Charles, Charles Price Jones, headquartered in Jackson, Mississippi in 1906. Okay? 1907, Mason, uh, Jeter, DJ Young go to California for the Azusa Street Revival. And when Mason comes back from the revival with the evidence of speaking in tongues, there's a disagreement between him and Charles Price Jones. Uh, Mason is uh, basically saying like Seymour and Charles Parham are saying it's mandatory to speak in tongues. They had the Holy Spirit. But Charles Price Jones is saying it's one of the signs of the Holy Spirit, not Mm -hmm. mandatory. And so therefore they split and at Mason's church, Frank Avant brings a lawsuit because he disagrees with Mason in the speaking in tongues because he can't understand what he's preaching because they're going in tongues for hours and hours and they don't understand what they're preaching. So he's saying that, you know, that you know, uh, people fall out on the floor and speaking in tongues and they can't understand them. So he brings a lawsuit and the lawsuit. Uh, I got the lawsuit here. I got a copy on my computer right here as well. It's 512 pages. It's Frank Avant versus C.H. Mason. In 1907, in the Chancellor Court of Shelby County in Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> I got the book. If you don't got it, Sanctified Revolution on Amazon. Okay. Yeah, I could put the whole court case in there. It was 512 pages. I think I put a copy of the, the uh, cover. The front of it, yeah. Yeah, the front of it. Yeah, but it's 512 pages on. And first, uh, like say, Charles Price Jones uh, and Frank Avant 
on on the side of like say of uh tongues are not mandatory uh for the holy ghost the speaker and speaking tongues are mentor to have the holy ghost and so they go to court and that's the subject that comes out the judge in shelby county in tennessee rules for charles price jones frank levant and charles price jones and saying that mason has strayed away from the original doctrine so they lose mason loses the first case okay but mason gets a lawyer uh that comes over from the methodist church the cme uh church um uh re hart robert e hart who comes over from cme he becomes a lawyer in like six months. Okay. But back then, only thing you had to do to become a lawyer, uh, sit on a lawyer for six months and read a couple of law books. Bam, you're a lawyer. <laughs> like the this, process. Process. <laughs> this is this is 19, like say 1907, 1908. And so Robert E. Hart, Bishop, Bishop Hart, takes the case and they um take the court case, there's a appeal it to the Supreme Court in Jackson, Tennessee. The Supreme Court in Jackson, Tennessee, overturns the decision of the lower court in Shelby County and awards the churches and the name Church of God in Christ to Mason. So therefore, um, Charles Price Jones has to choose another name. Hence, you get Church of Christ Holiness because uh, he's still with the Holiness Movement. And then you, uh, like say, and Mason goes with the Holiness Pentecostal Movement and the Church of God in Christ becomes Church of God in Christ Incorporated later on. But at first, uh, the charter that I have in 1922, it's Church of God in Christ of America. That's what the charter says. Okay, that's 1922. Because of the court cases, uh, it, the legal ramifications uh, held on after 1909 all the way to, like, say, 1922. And so they couldn't really be over the churches until the, the uh, legal, I think the legal matter had to pass over before they can join their churches again. But that was 1922. It's called Church of God in Christ of America. Okay. And then Church of God in Christ Incorporated comes later on. Uh, the name comes, I think, in the 50s, maybe around the 50s, uh, 40s or 50s, when you get Church of God Christ Incorporated. But that's the first, like I say, the first split uh, was between Charles Price Jones and Charles Harrison Mason in that split. Okay. So 1897, C.P. Right. Jones is already operating under the name Church of God in Christ. Right, because Mason got the name Church of God in Christ walking down 8th and Gain, and they decide to call their organization the Church of God in Christ. And in that court case in uh, Franklin Vaughn versus C.H. Mason, Charles Wright Jones lists that we are the Church of God in Christ headquartered in Jackson, Mississippi in 1906. Is that where... It says, it says in the court case. <laughs> <laughs> so then this whole, this whole contention between Mississippi and Tennessee being the headquarters of the first... Home yeah, now that that has that has that that that's still you you gotta do records with that now because you know Mason's church was in uh St. Paul, uh, Lexington, mm -hmm. Lexington. Right. That's supposed to be the mother church, right? Okay. Supposed to be supposed to be the mother church, right? And it was established around 1897. Bishop David Hall, who's the pastor in Temple uh church, which which, which was Saint's home church God in Christ, it was Mason's church. Mm -hmm. Uh well, he passed it now, but he it's temple now, but it used to be Saint's home when Mason had it. They were saying that may be the mother church because it was supposed to be established around the 1880s. But the thing is, okay, about churches and founding dates, they may not have a building. They might be met in a living room or something like that. You know, so uh, you count their founding date in the living room <laughs> or the gin house, which is 1897, which is Lexington founding gin house. So it, I, I noticed that. Uh, when you deal with founding dates, okay, well, they were just meeting in the living room or a, you know, a little room outside the house or something like that. Are we going to count that as a church or are we going to count the one in the gin house as a church, first church, you know? So it depends on your semantics and what are you counting as a church? Because the same thing happened in the Baptist church as well, you know? <laughs> whether you count an actual church building as a first church or you counting the building that was in a barn as a first church, you know? So it, it happens in all denominations, which one is the first church? Yeah. Dr. Hamilton, can you talk to us about Bishop Mason's views on women in ministry? Um, yeah, that, now, as far as I saw uh, his uh, views on women, uh, well, let, let me go back. Let me go to the manuals, first of all. Uh, and I know you probably women preaching, right? Women, not I mean, women, women as elders and pastors, overseers, and you know, know. right, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, when I think when Mason started, um, it wasn't 
See, because the Pentecostal movement at Azusa was an egalitarian movement. It didn't recognize gender. It didn't recognize race. Uh, no color. It, it, it made everybody on equal playing field because uh, you had a lot of women pastors come out of that Azusa Street movement. And because they weren't, like I said, they weren't recognizing gender or anything like that. And so I think Mason was, since he was a product of that movement, um, from what I see and the records I see, uh, he, like I say, he put the women on the same level as the men because Mother Robbins, the first mother, she had the title of overseer, just like the men had. And right. all the women leaders in the state had the title. Now, they were subject under the men, of course, but they still carried the title overseer. They carried the same title. And so I think Mason had that sort of like egalitarian spirit uh, that transcended race and gender uh, to it. And even in the early manuals, I have, I have the manual from 1944. I have the manual from 1957. And I have the manual from 1973. Of course, I think everybody has that one, the, the, you know, the, the one that they hadn't changed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that sir. Is only, that is the only manual that says that women cannot become pastors. The other two doesn't say that. That's the only manual, the one in 73. The other two manuals in 57 and 44 do not make that requirement because many women were pastors over churches and then they were holding the church till the man got there, a male got there, and then turned the church over to him. But they were preaching out churches. Uh, and then even Mother Robinson uh, got into a, the, it was sort of like a mini debate on whether women should preach or what we should be called teachers. And so you got it to Mother Robinson appeasing the men and saying that we just went, we just say women teach. We won't say they preach. So, so, so she had it to that foray. And so she uh, sort of settled that because like I said, the women's department was under the leadership of the bishop. And so she was like, say, uh, uh, powerful and subject, you know, under the bishop and everything like that. But that egalitarian spirit was that, you know, it wasn't no, uh, requirements or no stipulation that women couldn't become pastors or elders or, you know, a whole, because like I said, they had the same title as the men, overseer. They had the same title. Mm -hmm. yeah. Listen, I promise you, Dr. Helms. 73 is when you got that stipulation. Only when 1973, that's 1973 yeah. manual, you got that stipulation for women not becoming pastors, elders, bishops, and stuff like that. That's when you got it. Listen, I'm going to tell you something right there. People, there's some women in Church of God in Christ getting ready to splice that particular part of this whole interview right there. Well, and I mean, it's, it's there. I mean, look at it. It's there. It's, well, it's hard to come by the 44 men. I think I'm one of the only person that got one. <laughs> that Although, okay. Now, now now we're talking, so we need to come by your house. Later right. Later. It was a, it ain't too, it's not too many people that have a 1944 manual. <laughs> And in 1957, the only reason I got it because the bishop, Bishop J. Howard Dale and Mother Dale, uh, when he died, she gave me all of his things and all his artifacts from the Church of God in Christ. And I told her I would safe keep them. And even I put some in the Atlanta University Center's archives and That's things awesome. like that so people can look at them. It's digitized now so people can look at it all over the world if they want to now. But not, not many people like say had that 44 man and not many people had that blue book, the 57 man, which I found in my mother-in-law's house cleaning out. You know what's funny is I actually have the 57 manual yeah, the 57. in, in okay. digital form on my right. on my iPad and on my computer. Okay, okay. I'm gonna have to go back and look for that because yeah. I did I didn't, not like I say I didn't see any stipulation that women couldn't become pastors, elders, only in the 73. Yeah. Yeah, Ooh, wait, that information right there can make General Assembly real interesting, Reverend. <laughs> right now, even yeah. Wade Martin says, So, this women's issue is a modern thing, modern. it's just a modern <laughs> thing. <laughs> Mr. Linda Smith asked the question Are there any male missionaries in Kojic, or did they give that title to um, women only? That's like missionaries, as, as, as our definition, missionaries should be male and female because Paul was a missionary, but I think as far as Church of God in Christ and other maybe other churches. Is designated for titles women uh, for missionaries. Like when they got rid of the overseer title, um, you know, the women became supervisors and missionaries, uh, and then the you know the male became bishops and elders uh, for on the male side. Uh, but like I said, when they got rid of the overseer title, because like I say, overseer was a woman, overseer was a man, and same thing with missionary. Missionary was a man, 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 and it was a woman as well. But in our church, uh, the designated part to uh, clerical titles. Missionary was designated for a woman, but it can in his in his original definition it was women and men. It was neutral. It was gender neutral in his definition. Interesting. 
Very, very mm-hmm. interesting, mm-hmm. Dr. Hamilton. Oh, there, there are so many questions that I just want to hit you with. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Because, I'm, I'm you here. know, I'm here now. understanding, <laughs> understanding the the very colorful history of our mm-hmm. church, mm-hmm. and just the, the various splits that have happened. And oh, yeah. Like, like yeah. I really want to. This whole uh, it, it is often one of the one of the uh, I don't want to say arguments, but one of the conversations that I have with some of my friends um, mm-hmm. who are part of the AOG mm-hmm. is about their history. And them actually coming out of us as as a as a, a organization, and and so is there any truth to the fact that Bishop Mason's name is on their incorporating documents? I, I hadn't found evidence of that uh, because what um, see that split was sort of um, see not all the AOG ministers was was under Mason. Some of them were came from other organizations. Uh, of the Pentecostal, but Mason uh, supposedly in the records, Mason supposedly ordained a lot of the white ministers because he was one of the only ordaining Pentecostal bodies, and so the white ministers had to come to him to be get ordained. And so, but you see some of the ministers uh, who were under Mason, like say, uh, with two reasons, uh, whites were being persecuted at this time for worshiping with blacks, and then other thing is this is like say early 1900s, you have lynching. Uh, blacks going to, you have Tulsa, you have rides in Elaine, Arkansas, you have rides in Georgia, you know, blacks being lynched and things like that. So a lot of them didn't want to be under the authority of a black person. So uh, so due to racism of the time, they split off and formed the Assemblies of God. So and Mason even went to the assembly and, and you know, bid them Godspeed and things like that. He didn't seem like he didn't hold a grudge against them, uh, but he just bid them Godspeed. And so I think that uh, uh, a lot of them, like say, came from uh, other uh, different movements and got together. And then, like say, some of them were in uh, under the leadership of Mason. And then you also had the white churches of God in Christ at the time. I'm still trying to find, study them, too, because they were, I think they were, I meant for them, uh, Reverend Leonard P. Adams. So they had the white churches of God in Christ. <laughs> well, and that's another movement. <laughs> and so, so I think a lot of times is that even though, like, say, many of them were under Mason and under his leadership, uh, they joined the Assemblies of God. And so you had some of them uh, coming from Mason and coming, like, say, uh, refusing due to the racism at the time, left the Black Church of God and Christ leader and joined their white uh, counterparts and formed their own movement and formed their own Pentecostal movement. So even uh, for a shining moment at Azusa where everybody's worshiping together, uh, there come that racism dog again that spits everybody up. And so, so like I say, for one shining moment at Azusa, you have everybody worshiping together and being together in the racial uh, atmosphere. Then all of a sudden that racism of the South just rears and segregation, Jim Crow rears his ugly head. And even in the church, uh, they separate and uh, under, uh, like I say, uh, go to a separate and form their own church. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So. When and, then, was, uh, and the Simple God did try to reconcile. I think they did it once in the 90s, and they did it in 2014, too. They came out services on a Founders Day. Right, and, right. Because I didn't know it was with Bishop Blake the last time uh, in 2014. They came by and said they were, gave an apology for what happened, you know, back then. <laughs> you know? Wade Mar- Elder Wade Martin from Alabama asked the question, uh-huh. so what is keeping our church from reintegrating now? Uh, I think because, you know, Sims of God, uh, like they've been around since uh, 1914. And uh, from what I see, they have a thriving you know, ministry, thriving you know, as far as finance, for his administration. I mean, like I said, so um, I think it's just that since their legacy has uh, extended since 1914, it doesn't seem like they want to, uh, you know, they fellowship with us, but I don't think they want to really come, like I say, under under us like they were in, like, say, in the early 1900s because their ministries are th- uh, thriving all around the world. I think they're one of the largest Pentecostal bodies as well uh, around the world because you have assembly gods, like, say, all over the world and things like that. So, and I hear a lot of ministers, like, say, oh, I'm going over the of God <laughs> instead of Church of God, right? So, so, just like AME, you know, they get a retirement. <laughs> so, so, the preachers go, you know, over there as well. And so, I think a lot of times, it's like say their legacy has been around so long. Like say they do the fellowship with us and 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 do that 
as far as unification, but not necessarily fall under us. But and I think that's probably will be the level of integration where we worship with them, do service with them, and partner with them in different programs around the world, which we should be doing anyway, uh, as far as the ministry and things like that. So that's what I think. Mm-hmm. Delinda Smith asked the question: Who started Kojic United? That was uh okay. Now there is um there's okay, we can't get them mixed up. There's Church of God in Christ United, and there's United Church of God in Christ. Mm-hmm. Okay, she's looking at the one, she's talking about the one on the back end. Okay, Church of God in Christ United started around 1964, 65, and that was by Bishop James Feltis Jr. He left the Church of God in Christ, incorporated our church. Uh, during the 60s, during the turmoil of the 60s, uh, the, the, I call it the big split. He, he left during that time, along with Church of God in Christ International, uh, along with Church of God in Christ of America Incorporated. <laughs> and so that movement came out of uh, the split when they, uh, O.T. Jones, during the, the O.T. Jones era. And so Church of God in Christ United was started by Bishop James Feltis Jr. Bishop James Feltis Sr., uh, helped Bishop Mason in New Orleans to, to stir off uh, Triumph the Kingdom in Church of God in Christ. That was around 1912. That's Bishop Lyons Jensen Smith. Okay, that was his father, uh, James Felton Senior. So this Church of God in Christ United was started by James Felton Junior, who just recently died about three or four years ago. Uh, but he separated from Church of God in Christ Incorporated and formed Church of God in Christ United out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Okay, United Church of God in Christ. Uh, was started by Bishop Marshall Carter, who was part of Cathedral of Faith now. It's, it was Jones Avenue back then. This is just in Georgia. But right it was, in Atlanta, right? Yeah, right here in Atlanta, right. It's these Cathedral of Faith now, but it was John, old Jones Avenue. You probably, 591 Jones Avenue, you know, another church, a uh, famous church. But Tur- United Church of God in Christ started by Marshall Carter when he separated from Church of God in Christ under J.O. Patterson. When Bishop Bradley, who was over Jones Avenue and later, uh, like I say, later that was called Cathedral, but he separated, he made Bradley a bishop. And when Bradley, Bishop Bradley died, they didn't make Marshall Carter a bishop and take his place. And so he separated and formed United Church of God in Christ in 1982. Okay. In Fairburn, Georgia, headquarters in Fairburn, Georgia. So that's the difference between Church of God in Christ United on the back end and United Church of God in Christ on the front end. <laughs> Oh, that race to the ring in the chain that caused people to do some crazy things. I tell you what, <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yeah. But I, found, I think I found about fifteen or sixteen different churches of God in Christ so far. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. Reformed Church of God in Christ out of North Raleigh, North Carolina. There's Free Church of God in Christ in Alabama. There's uh, Church of God in Christ Congregational. There's Congregational Church of God in Christ. There's Church of God, Evangelist Temple, House of Refuge for All Nations, Church of God in Christ. <laughs> There's Church of God in Christ, Jesus Apostolic. Uh, so I found about 15 different churches of God in Christ. Yeah. 15, and I'm still and still finding them. Still finding And they them. all do they all all lead back to Mason. Yeah. All lead back to Mason. Uh the splits come in, like say some of them recognize Mason O. T. Jones, you know. And then, uh, and then some of them, like I say, the early ones separated from Mason, like Church of God, right? Jesus Apostolic, Evangelist Temple, House of Refuge, All Nations, Triumph, the Kingdom, Church of God in Christ. They separated while Mason was still living. <laughs> let's let's talk about those dark years of the church. That that OT Jones, that whole we call it dark years. <laughs> we don't call it dark years. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about them. OT Jones era, yeah. OT there we go. OT Jones talk about the Jones era, Doc. Cause that yeah. was just some some shady. Well, it all started. It was, it was all, okay. OT Jones, like I say, took over. Uh Mason died in 61. Uh, uh around November 61, uh Bishop Mason went home and, and passed away. Um, well, they waited a whole year before they selected the leader. Of the Church of God in Christ, so they so it went to sixty two November, right November sixty two, because they like I say they waited, they felt that you know nobody can lead them after Mason, and that feeling would draw over into the OT Jones era. So in nineteen sixty two, all the bishops, I got a picture of it, uh, one it's in one of my books here. I think I put it online too, but it's all the bishops like E. Hamilton, A. B. McEwen, John Seth Bailey, O. M. Kelly. All of them congratulate O.T. Jones on becoming the senior bishop. Mm-hmm. I got the newspaper clipping 
where they are, you have O.T. Jones and the executive board, the executive board, President A.B. McEwen uh, is like the general board now. Um, but the executive board, A.B. McEwen, Vice President John said Bailey out of Detroit. And the uh, secretary was Gerald Patterson, who was also the secretary of the church as well, the general secretary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> So after Bishop O.T. Jones, I think he started out real well. Uh, he was he had a plan for the church. Uh, I I got a, a clipping, so I got a book where his he had like a 12, 13 point plan where they want and in that plan he wanted to get a census, which I think we should, uh, should try to do a census now. Thank and, Bishop Bishop uh, Shear mm -hmm. just brought that up in his last address that he's going to yeah. take a census to the church. Yeah, we need to take a census. See how many people we got. I think that should be done. Yeah. You mean we ain't got six point five million members? I don't know how many we got. I can't. I can't, as a story, I can't prove that. I need twelve thousand churches. <laughs> I need to see some proof. <laughs> I need to see some proof. <laughs> some numbers. <laughs> My God. But yeah, some numbers are proof. And so it started like the OT Jones started. Uh, like his tenure started. He was trying to do well for the church. Trying to do for the people. So around 1964, so he took over in 62, about maybe not two years in, a letter comes from the general secretary, J.O. Patterson, telling all the preachers to come to Memphis uh, to do, uh, I guess, help with the maintenance of the temple and things like that. Well, O.T. Jones or the senior bishop say, well, you don't have that authority. You know, you need to go, you know, I'm the senior bishop. That needs to come, from, you know, from me. So you had, so now O.T. Jones is confrontational with, Gerald Patterson. John said Bailey stepped in. The vice president of the of the executive board steps in and backs Gerald Patterson. D. Lawrence Williams stepped in, who's over the board of bishops, steps in and saying that that letter was out of order. <laughs> okay. So now you got uh, Patterson, uh, executive board with John said Bailey, A.B. McEwen going against O.T. Jones, uh, 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 D. Lawrence Williams, and Bishop Ranger out of Texas, the Texas Ranger, <laughs> Bishop Ramey Eugene Ranger out of Texas. And so that letter caused a stir and it caused uh, J.O. Patterson to put down on paper that tells O.T. Jones, you just a ceremonial leader. So in other words, you just a figurehead. You don't have any power. We gave you that position because in honor of Bishop Mason and in honor of you because you served so long, but you don't have any power or authority in the senior bishop position. Only Mason carried that power. <laughs> so, so what happens is the executive board, and I got the uh, the uh, the convocation books. If you notice, uh, I got the one from 66, 65, and I think 67. And on those convocation books, there's no senior bishop on that. It says the executive board presiding. No senior bishop presiding. And so not even recognizing his position. And so what plays out, you get a battle between the O.T. Jones and the executive board uh, with A.B. McEwen, John Seth Bailey, and J.O. Patterson. It plays out in the court case in Alabama where Bishop um, uh, Bishop Ashworth, uh, they, uh, the executive board led by A.B. McEwen, Patterson, and Bailey takes the jurisdiction in Alabama Alabama, you know, they don't have one jurisdiction. They split it, and they give the other half to Bishop Bailey's brother, James Bailey, in, in, in uh, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And so they split that. That's and that's one court case that comes out. Okay, the other court case is they go to Texas and takes Bishop Ranger's jurisdiction through a court case. And then the final court case happened in 1967, which is the big one, was O.T. Jones, Senior, Junior, and Ranger against Gerald Patterson, A.B. McEwen, et al. And that's the one that decides that they did away with the senior bishop, they did away with the executive board, and that court case led to the development of the presiding bishop and the general board. And, of course, Bishop J.O. Patterson won that first election, with John Seth Bailey coming in a close second. So as you said in your book on page 160, mm -hmm. while Mason was the face of Kojic from 1907 to 1961, Mm -hmm. J.O. Patterson, Mason's son-in-law, became the face of the Church of God in Christ from 1968 to 1989. Right. Mm -hmm. You still erased seven years of history there, Doc. <laughs> I'm just saying, you erased it. I'm just... Well, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, 
the thing is that I, I looked at the leadership of that, but I definitely in that section I gave homage to OT Jones because I gave him whole era and what yeah, happened yeah, his era. I, I gave him that whole era. Like I say, and so like I say from that time. Uh, like say people call it, I think I was making a point about dark years and years of wilderness wonderings and things like that. Yeah. Which I can say, uh, <laughs> but I have evidence now what happened. And I show evidence and I got, like say, the pictures of O.T. Jones and of the uh, writings and evidence of his plan that he had for the church and things like that. And uh, and also the uh, thing about Gerald Patterson during that time when they were saying that Bishop Jones didn't have any power and he appointed bishops at the time and they say he didn't have any power but one of the bishops he pointed was jd husband and so jd husband went on like say in georgia he was part of georgia as well he wanted to serve on the general board and he but he was appointed by bishop ot jones but they were saying his appointments didn't carry you know he didn't have authority to appoint anybody and so what happened was and to prove his authority uh they got bishop Ura from maryland eastern shores out the bed he was sick and flew him down to memphis and showed J.O. passing where he signed the uh the uh the uh appointment certificate for him to be bishop and uh as a secretary and so that like I say he basically called in a lie you know in that and so them showing that proof of the evidence that they had and that's what bishop ranger uh his whole segue was always liars and so that was his segue into that showing that you know that he's proven that they're liars on that on that issue mm -hmm. that, boy this grand old church i want to i want to Switch to the women's department for a little bit, Doc. Okay. Uh, because it, <clears throat> the women's department has been very instrumental and very powerful in the life of this church. Yeah. Uh, even yeah. even at times pushing even our sainted founder to do things he didn't necessarily want to do, issuing statements about wars and mm -hmm. so how do we yeah. go? Talk talk us through that because I'm you know I'm still on this 1973 uh constitution. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still there because you know I, I so I, I will I will in all fairness tell you, Dr. Well, like I said, the women had uh if you look at the women, um uh they took basically they ran the home and foreign mission departments. Uh mm -hmm. like I say they were in the early church of God in Christ, uh women's like uh Mother Robinson, and Mother Coffee. Uh, and Mother Bailey, uh, like Mother Coffee, she was out of uh, Illinois, and so she had, like, I say, she uh, was the, like, I say, established one of the first churches in Illinois, Church of God in Christ, Illinois, and Bishop William Roberts, Roberts Temple, where Emmett Till's funeral was. Okay, mm -hmm. he came up and took over that movement that that, that she had started up there. Uh, but Mother Robinson, like, I say, uh, from uh, also from Arkansas, stern woman, uh, now. What well, we often thought, what I often thought, uh, that not wearing pants, not wearing makeup, uh, not wearing uh, gaudy hats, I thought all that came from me and preachers. But no, that came from Mother Robinson. <laughs> that came from Mother Robinson. Uh, she, she wanted you not only to be holy inside, but to look holy on the outside. So she wore long sleeves, dress draped the floor, uh, taught stern holiness in dress, and attitude and administration. So she was like say uh uh the powerful <laughs> leader and first overseer and like say first leader of the women's department. And then she not only took like say not only they took over the home mission and getting churches in the United States, but they took over the foreign mission and going to overseas in Cuba, Haiti, Africa, and establishing missions over there as well. So they had that established, and then she you noticed know, that she is she was also key in Bible band. Because Bible band taught the women how to read. And like Satan, that's how the women uh, leaders helped the preachers because men and preachers couldn't read. But the women could because they would take in Bible band. And so they would read the Bible and then the preacher would expound on the Bible. And that's how you got those so-called read-on messages because the women read for the men. Right. Exactly. The women were readers. And the Bible band was teaching them how to read and like say, also giving them Bible study, interpreting the Bible as well. So she was over that department. And so uh, after she, like I say, did her stint, and, and uh, her last thing was that she bought the sign out in front of uh, Mason Temple uh, with her own money. She bought the sign, and she was able to see Mason Temple built, and that, you know, that was one of her, uh, you know, one of her lasting accomplishments. She wanted to get that built, and then like her, after her came Mother Coffee. Now she was almost not the first mother because Bishop Mason wanted Mother Coffee to be, 
But Mother Coffee deferred because she was young. And she said, you need a more seasoned, older mother to be the leader of the church. And she deferred to Mother Coffee uh, as being, not me, Mother uh, Robinson as being the first mother. And then, like I said, Mother Coffee took over after um, uh, Mother Robinson. And then Mother Coffee uh, sort of lightened uh, the, um, the restrictions a little bit. You know, the dress didn't have to drape the floor, but they come up to the knee, you know. <laughs> so, and you won't have to wear the long sleeves. Right. You didn't have to wear the all long sleeves, but the sleeves can come up to your armpits, you know, stuff like that, you know. So, so she lacks the, uh, you know, the dress codes a little bit. But uh, she's famous for the women's convention. Having the first women's convention around 1951 uh, in LA, uh, Bishop uh, Crouch's church, uh, I think Emmanuel Temple, uh, Bishop Let's Samuel Crouch. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the history, even of that, because mm -hmm. what we have made these conventions to be was not even the original intent. So, my mm -hmm. understanding is the women's convention uh, and all things that led up to the women's convention all went to support foreign missions. Yeah, man, yeah, because the women, uh, they were heavy and the hip, they were the leaders of that home, home, and, like I say, they were the leaders of the home and foreign mission department, the women. Right. <laughs> and so, like I said, the uh, the original intent of those uh, uh, conventions uh, was fellowship, first of all, fellowship that the women had, and then also the monies that they raised, like I say, going to build missions overseas, want to build uh, nursing homes or of the home scene, putting money together to, like say, build a community and build neighborhoods and things like that. And especially, like say, going overseas and establishing missions overseas. So a lot of, like say, uh, especially Mother Coffee, uh, like say, she was a key in getting funds to, uh, uh, like say, support the church and support the missions uh, overseas. Now, um, and like say, that 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 convention like that she had was uh like say real power because she she would meet with the mayors of the city and because they realize they bring all these women to the city that brings money economy to the city right. and things like that so she would meet with the mayor i think she met with the mayor of los angeles and things like that and so uh, the, and then she uh had the convention go around to different cities um but also the women in raising money they were the strong financial arm of the church and so what Still happened like <laughs> what happened? Uh, what happened? One time, Mother Coffee was trying to get a financial accounting of, I think, how much women, what the women were given in the church and the records of it, and so it came down to like maybe uh, it was after Mason had passed away, but it came down to like say she was almost like say threatened to hold back the ties <laughs> that they were giving from the church because you know they were, uh, it it was anywhere from like maybe. I had some like maybe half, maybe half of the, to three fourths of the funds were coming from women, you know, things like that. As far as you know, as far as the financial backing of the church, so like say she had threatened to you know withhold the tithes and offerings so that you know she can get a a stern report uh, or a good report on what was going you know what was going on financially. My and lord. Like and then later, I think they later she said she, I think the story later said she repented of that. <laughs> <laughs> came back in the fold, you know, so. But, uh, yeah, like I say, that women's convention was pretty powerful as far as raising funds and uh, uh, setting, like say, the home and foreign mission departments uh, that they were over the Bible band, sewing circle, all that, you know, uh, keeping those departments afloat and, like I say, also training women and uh, doing missions overseas and home and foreign mission. And then you also, at, after her, you had Mother Ann Bailey. I mean, after her, who's the wife of John Seth, Bishop John Seth Bailey, uh, carrying on, uh, like I say, from Mother Coffee. Um, then Mother Madame McLaughlin, same thing with her, carrying on with the Proven in Purple. She had the purple, the hospitality, and things like that. Building organizations like that in order to help the Church of God in Christ uh, through the Women's Project, raising funds, and uh, like I say, uh, keeping the church financially solvent. Dr. Hamilton, we're, we're approaching the hour mark, and I don't want to keep you because okay. I know, listen. Oh, no problem. I'm good, bro. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I, I do have just some other questions, though. Okay. Um, as you have studied the history of this church from beginning to now, um, are we, do you think that we're on the path that Bishop Mason envisioned for us to be? Oh. Uh. Hmm. Uh, I think. Uh, 
That's a good question because I think Mason's um, Mason. I think his vision was uh, like I say. His, I think his vision was completed because there. Uh, one of his uh, assessed vision was that there was no no building to be able to hold the members of the Church of God correct, and that's you know as we've seen that's true <laughs> with that. Um, but I think I think a lot of, I think times um, I think we sort of lost uh, some of the essence of his leadership and his ideals after he died, I, and I think it, it um, uh, especially during the way like I said he was the first senior bishop. You only had two senior bishops, as Mason and Jones. So I think uh, we definitely went from uh, I think a what he, I believe he was more, I guess a more spiritually based and more um, uh, I would say more of the people centered and things like that. I think that we've uh, I think we left some of that foundation that I think that he was trying to give to the church and trying to be an example of, uh, especially. And so, but I think that. Uh, I think the example that he set is there, but I think that after nineteen, after nineteen sixty one, after he died, and I, and I sort of, I don't want to say fault him, but I sort of uh, make him lay a blame because he did he didn't leave a clear successor to follow him, you know, because I think the incident with O.T. Jones and Joe Pass and John Seth Bailey, A.B. McEwen. I think if he had established a clear successor to follow him or, or a person designated that he designated, no, I want this person to step into my shoes and, and lead this movement on. I think that would have solidified all the stuff that happened after he died. Uh, it would, I think the splits and a lot of the uh, political fights and things like that would have been aside if he had uh, just established a clear cut successor somebody who could sit here and carry the movement forward. So um, after, like I say, after he died, it was sort of like a, what I see in the history, it's sort of like a free fall. You know, uh, uh, his son-in-law, Joe Patterson, uh, some people even wanted Mother Coffee to lead and things like that. Uh, 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 his son, uh, Charles Has Mason, who was killed around 1964. Uh, we still have, you know, don't know who his killer it was. And I think that if he had left a clear-cut successor, I think the church would have been on better footing and better foundation uh, that he, uh, probably looked more like what he wanted. It, I think what he wanted to look like if he had left a clear cut successor to somebody to see him carry on the, the message. I believe brother Wade Martin agrees with you. He said it was okay. Bishop Mason's fault for not having <laughs> left legacy in place. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> Listen, you know what? I, I think, I think at some point, uh, Dr. Hamilton, we just got to call a spade a spade. But I mean, I think, I think that, the, the, that, okay. Yeah. So look at it. And that same thing that happened then is mm -hmm. happening now when we don't leave clear cut successors or have succession plans in plans place. In place. Yeah, right. It's a free fall. Yeah, right. so it basically comes a free fall. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what happened. And I like say, I think that, you know, if it let's like say if he had left OT Jones, he's the guy, you know, he's the guy and he's gonna lead. And then, you know, then he trains somebody under him to take his place. And then, you know, it just, you know, goes and for succession wise. But uh, like I say, I think uh, a lot of times, like I say, especially uh, after, like, say, the, the first convention of 1968, where you got voting and, and you just got, we just uh, went down that voting road. And I don't think, uh, like, say, with Mason, that was that wasn't that voting kind of, you know, that voting for things and political aspect, because, you know, he was a leader and that was it, you know. And there was some we challenge that he had. King. That's, yeah. Right. And there, there were some challenges that he had. People challenged. Out there. there were some challenges, but they were overridden because, you know, because he was the founder and basically the face of the Church of God in Christ from 1907 to 1961. And so, like I say, but like I say, after that, it it's definitely became political, more political and more, uh, you know, more uh, personality driven as well than uh, than actually spirituality, what Mason was about. Do you believe, based on everything that you have read, studied and researched, Bishop Mason will be pleased with what he sees today? Do I believe would he be pleased? <laughs> um, I think according to him, I don't think he would be. I, I don't think he would be. Uh, especially um, um, now, 
not saying not saying you expect everybody to be perfect. But I, I think uh, the different splits and the different fights and the different political uh, ramifications that we brought in with the conventions, uh, uh, with the Constitution and things like that, I think, um, and getting rid of his title. We got rid of his title, see, Bishop. <laughs> So I, I definitely don't think he'd be pleased we got rid of his title. <laughs> it's like that. So so I, I, I don't think he would be. Uh, like I say, I think, uh, like I say, they used to start the convocation with three days of fasting and prayer when they started the convocation and things like that. So I think, um, um, I think that uh, I don't, like I say, I don't think he would be uh, today. Today, I don't think he would be. And like I say, especially after the 1968 incident. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, boy. Dr. Hamilton, I would like to thank you for um, oh, no problem. Yeah. taking the time out tonight. Uh, one last question before we go off of air. What's the deal with Bishop Mason's body yeah. being in Mason Temple? Uh, well, now for the longest, um, you know that body was in the front of the sanctuary before you walk in the sanctuary, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they moved it though. They moved it since I forgot when they moved it, but they moved to the side over there. Uh, but um, I think it goes to that legendary status again. Uh, that, um, like, say that legendary, um, um, that divine kind of uh, shining you saw behind him in that picture. Uh, so and they decided, like say, it was glass casket to see his body. And so it's like, you know, he was the founder. He was the leader. He was Dad Mason. Uh, he uh, cast out devils. He raised the dead. And so it was like, the, I guess, the, uh, like say, the, the ultimate respect to that, you know, that even though you're dead, you know, your spirit still lives with us. And so as that body is that connection that we have to you as a respect to you. We uh, we still honor you and things like that. So therefore, I believe that's why they left the body in the front so people can pay homage to it when they walked into the sanctuary. But it was sort of like I say I was I think I went to convocation. My first convocation was 1982, I think. Uh, and so I saw that I was sort of creep, creeping out you know, so <laughs> as being a, I was only like 16. I think I was 16, 15 or 16 at the time when I saw it. But um I think it was that due to their honor, honoring him and not wanting him to be discarded, but always remembering him. And again, like say um, you have that uh, Mason era and then like say before uh, a lot of history was done, you had the Mason era and then you had Gerald Patterson era, you just skipped over O.T. Jones and things like that. But um, but basically, like say the honor Mason and on his legacy and on his uh his uh development and his his founding of the church of god of christ so they uh you know sort of like left his body out there as an homage pay homage to him now i wouldn't have done it but you know they were the leaders at the time that's what they did so <laughs> but that's what they did so <laughs> <laughs> Doc Hamilton, I'll be honest with you, man. I got a, I got a question in me that's just burning. I, okay. I do, and I don't know who's watching. Uh, Honestly, I don't really care because <laughs> as 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 a person who watches history, you mm -hmm. have been studying the ebbs and flows of this church from mm -hmm. nineteen from eighteen ninety seven. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. 1897 to now you've we've watched the ebbs and the flows the splits the contentions you've you've seen it all so you've right studied there. it all mm -hmm. when was the last split that this church had the last split uh 2011 church of god and 2000 i think the last one i recorded 2011 church of god and christ church of god and christ america incorporated in 2011, we had Church of God in Christ of American Corporate in like 1964. So the difference is the you, of. The difference is the of. <laughs> so based on what you what based mm -hmm. on what you've studied, based mm -hmm. on what you've seen, mm -hmm. Bishop Ray Lee, he's the leader of that movement. Yeah. Do you see or sense that we're getting ready to head towards another split here soon? Um. 
it's possible. I, I've seen some uh, signs, uh, uh, I, and I heard some talking about it in another split, uh, but I can't really predict it because I think uh, what I heard. I think the person, you know, was. I don't think they would do it. I don't. I don't think so. But uh, but I heard talk. I've heard um, rumors about another split and things like that. But like I said, I don't think. And then remember, a lot of these splits, probably less than ten thousand people. I, I would say. Like the uh, other churches I mentioned, maybe less than, maybe even less than five thousand. So I mean, some of these places you, you don't even know they happen because there's so few people that that leave and things like that. So, uh, but I right now, like I say, I don't see a major split happen with uh, under leadership of Bishop Shear right now because I don't think it's, I don't think it's like I say that bad as it was in '68, and uh, and like I say the the other splits that happen, especially these uh, the new the newer splits. Uh, the people, like say, probably less than ten thousand people, and if we, if your organization was six million, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna miss ten thousand. Six point five million, but we don't see, we, we don't even see one five hundred thousand show up to the convocation. We show sure don't see that many people on the general assembly. But I'm not gonna deal with that. Yeah. I'm but yeah, I, I don't actually, I don't see any major. I put this, I don't see any major splits on the horizon, like. Like the things that happened in '68, I don't, I don't see anything like that happening. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Maybe like say little splits on the side where people form, uh, like say another organization on the side, you know, but not any major. I'd say major split. Yeah. Gotcha, Doctor Hamilton. Let me say thank you so much for uh, yielding your time tonight no to problem, just no problem, be con uh, very candid. Um, in your discussion with us about the history of the Church of God in Christ. To those who are watching, I will plug it once again. If you have not picked up your copy of Sanctified Revolution, I would encourage you uh, to pick up a copy on Amazon. Uh, on, or Dr. Ovell, do you have a, a website that they can purchase it from? Um, yeah, just on Amazon right now. Yeah, just okay. Amazon. And uh, you know, those are two senior bishops on that too. Uh, yes, sir. Let's, oh, oh, yes. Two. Oh, trust two. and believe. I'm... I'm I peeps it all. Like you well, ain't got to worry about that. Yeah. You, know, you, 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 you see what's on the back, but I right. paid attention to right. what's right. on the front. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to encourage you, if you have not purchased it, to pick up a copy. Uh, it makes no sense to be a part of an organization that you know nothing about. Know nothing about uh, right. and, and you're not able to defend the history of the church if you don't know it. And so right. I want to encourage you. Uh, as as we as we said earlier, as Dr. Hamilton explained earlier, the picture that even that I posted with Dr. Uh, with Bishop Mason uh, holding up uh, uh, sticks and hands in the shape of hands. Yeah. Um, this is nature and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, the, mm -hmm. Bishop. Uh, the, the question is that: Is there an ebook, Doctor Hamilton? Uh, not yet. Okay. Yeah, the next one will be though. The next one will gotcha. be. Gotcha. I'm all already right. on another book right now. I'm trying to do the state. Uh, I'm starting with Georgia. I'm doing the state histories of the Church of God in Christ. So I'm wow. To state wow. We're getting ready to have a full comprehensive history of this grand old church. Um, I, I, I Listen, I, I, I can't thank you enough. This won't be the last time. I, I think that it's important that the history of this church is out. Um, I would love to ask one of my sisters in, 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 in this grand old church to come on. And we ask you questions specifically about the women's department. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I am not... Gone past this 1973 piece, sisters that are watching, you heard him say you got the 57, you got the book in the 57, you got that one. Yeah, so. this book right here says yeah. women can't can't pass the but yeah, right. uh, the ones before this book didn't say, say that. that they can. Didn't Once again, Mother Marba, the name of the book is Sanctified Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, by Dr. Ovell Hamilton. It is a comprehensive history of the Church of God in Christ. And so, if you do not have it. Go to Amazon, pick up a copy of it. It's a great read. It's an easy read. Uh, it's something that you need to have as part of your of your uh, repertoire of information about this grand old church. Uh, listen, this Sunday night, uh, we will be back for Elephants in the Room, 8.05 p.m. We will have a very comprehensive dis uh, discussion uh, about reparations, okay. We will be having a conversation about reparations this week. Next week, we will be talking about uh, the President Barack Obama era of the United States. We'll talk about if his policies and administration were good for Black folks, or was he just good for the morale of of, of us as a people to have him in the White House? 
And then we will end uh, our month of conversations with a uh, uh, conversation about the black church past, present and our future. Mm -hmm. And so we want you to tune in uh, and join us. Join the conversation. Ask questions in the chat. Uh, we don't mind answering because we're not scared to do it. All right. Listen, I love you all. We'll see you on Sunday. Peace. <laughs>